Well, thank you for being here today, really. I know that uh, it's uh, in our city, it's very difficult right now. Everywhere you drive, um, it's a challenge. I mean, you see the faces of even police officers, it's like a blank stare. And, and it makes sense because we're all hurting, we're all in shock, we're in pain. And, um, but there's answers, there, there are some answers. And, uh, and I'm praying that today as you hear the message that you're gonna find some comfort and, and also know how to respond and how to handle uh, trauma and how to handle uh, circumstances like what we just experienced with the wisdom of God. But let me just tell you something. Everything we're seeing in our world right now is, is pretty much upside down. I mean, you just talk about the political temperature of our country. It's, it's not the greatest. And, and, and if we don't understand that beyond the mass shootings that we're seeing in our country, that there's something evil, there's something dark, there's something demonic behind all this, then we'll literally be blinded and never know how to be proactive and, uh, and to really think, how do we prepare as, as God's people? How do we, how do we, how do we become uh, progressive with our children? How do we, how do we equip our children to, to be the best? But it starts at home. It starts with you and me. Let me show you a verse in Psalms 133. And then after I'm done, I'm just going to lay a foundation. I'm going to have Dr. Jason come up and then hit some things. Psalm 133, it's a, it's a very short verse in the Bible. It says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for people to dwell together in unity. Another version says, how beautiful is it? How wonderful, how beautiful it is for people to dwell together in what? Unity. Now, let me tell you something. You and I know very well that you can be dwelling together, but not necessarily be in unity. Like you can be in the workplace you can be in the church place. You can be in your house. And you can be dwelling together with your loved ones, your family, your spouse. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there is any unity that's happening in that moment. And this means that God wants us to bring unity back in our family, in our church, in our workplace, in a crisis like what we're experiencing today. And when you think about this verse, and I'm going to finish this verse right now, but I want, I want to just tie this back to John 17, because when you read in John 17, Jesus is praying to God the Father. And in this one prayer that Jesus is praying to the Father, five times he says the same. It's all, and mind you, Jesus is not a repetitive, he wasn't repetitive. But in this John chapter 17, he repeats himself five times. He said this, he said, make them one. Make them one, make them one, make them one, make them one. So think about this. It obviously was a big deal for Jesus to get across to you and I to make sure that we are one, that we're in agreement, right? Here's what God said. He said, he said create for me a holy nation. And you know what we did? We created denominations that divide us, that separate us. That's what we're seeing in our society. But like I said, you look at our, our political uh, temperature right now. I mean, it's so divided, right? We are divided as a country. We are divided even sometimes as a church or as a family, right? Or as a workplace sometimes. There's some division. And I want you to listen clearly because there's something you're going to get out of this. Obviously, once again, this was a big deal for Jesus to say this, make them one. You know why? Because if the devil can divide us, then he can conquer us. A house divided will not what? Stand. If you're divided in your house, you don't have a fighting chance. The doors are open when you're divided. And we need to bring unity tonight. As a matter of fact, tonight, Santa Clarita is putting together a vigil. And I have the honor of being one of the speakers tonight to speak into the youth uh, that will be there tonight. But my biggest focus tonight is to unify our youth tonight in this city. It's to bring them a hope of unification, to bring them a sense of dwelling together with one mind, one heart. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul prayed? He said, I wish you would all think the same. I wish you would all believe the same. I wish you would all speak the same. And that's the issue we're having today in our society is that we have so many opinions when not realizing that the Bible should be governing our decisions. 
Are you with me this morning? So let's keep reading. So he says in verse 2, It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. Now, you may be sitting there like, what the heck is oil have to do with running on some dude's beard? And uh, You know what that is? What the scripture is saying, it says that the anointing is attractive when there's unity. What's the anointing? It's God's presence in your life. There's nothing more attractive than to find a believer who's anointed, who, who's been in the presence of God, who's connected with God in such a way where you can literally, you can feel the presence and the love of God in their life. And so he's saying this. He says, it's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there, for where? There. Where's there? Unity. He says, for there the Lord commanded the blessing and he commanded life forever. What? More. I want you to know that God is saying, I will anoint and I will command my blessing on any people that will unite together, dwell together in unity. And how many of you right now, we need the blessing of God, but the first step for us to see healing in this land is to unify ourselves again. And it starts with the church. You can't start saying, well, the world needs to get it together. No, the church needs to get it together, and then the church is the answer to the world. We have to be the answer to this world. And so no wonder the enemy wants to divide our families, our homes, our church, our country, our lives, because the enemy wants us to be those type of Christians that are always fussy. We're arguing, we're quarreling, we're fighting each other, not realizing that. Let me, say, let me tell you something. Division is saints' playground. Come on, he'll just swing you, and, and you know, you're just like, yeah, and I hate you, Ew. yeah, and I don't like you, Ew. and you suck, Ew. and you're just, and he just swings you, and you know what he does? Is he just, he puts us to sleep, right? He lull, lullaby, baby, on the treetop, right? And he just, he, what does he do? He puts us to sleep. But I, I, listen, the only good that I can see out of this horrendous, horrific, evil thing is that the sleeping giant has awakened. The church is waking up. The church is having to make a decision to step up, to stand out, and to move forward. We have to. We have to do this. But that means that we have to be in unity. And there's nothing that God won't do for people who are willing to unite together. You Listen, Satan can't stop what God wants to bless. But there's a responsibility that comes with that, and that's called unity. Unity, unity, unity. That means we have to pray together in unity. When we pray, man, we all have to be in it. Man, we have to be desperate when we're praying to God, like, God, save us. God, deliver us. It has to be the cry of every single heart. Look at this. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. There's a time to rejoice. When we're, if, if I'm rejoicing, you, you should be rejoicing. If you're rejoicing, I should be rejoicing. So there's a time for rejoicing, but there's also a time to weep. And this is the time where we weep. How do I deal with people, pastor? How do I connect? Like there's all these people that are struggling. So like how do I, how do I handle all this? You weep with them. You cry with them. You don't have the answers. He's the answer. Amen? You show them the love of Jesus. You just hug them. You know that sheriff that was here at the last service? Just gave her a big hug. I said, thank you. We love you. Okay? A lady from the mortuary, she was here at the service. Thank you so much. We love you. Prayed for her. That's what we do. That's what people are looking for. You hear me? We need to be the light, the salt of the earth. We need this. Look at John 16, 33. I want you to see this because Jesus made this very clear. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. What kind of peace? Perfect peace. And what? Confidence. In the world you, you have tribulation. In this world you have trials. In this world, you're going to have distress. You will be frustrated. But be of good cheer. And it's not easy to be of good cheer when you're going through something so heavy like what we're experiencing. It's a somber moment. But let me tell you something. It may not be the season for a cheer, but it's definitely a season to take courage. 
and we can't take courage. It says, be confident, be certain, be undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. And we have to understand something very clearly, okay? And I said this at the last two services, but history is a record of crisis. Because so often you have people, and listen, I've been a pastor now for nine years, but I've been in ministry for like 20 years, and, and people always say, why do bad things happen to good people? Have you ever had anybody ask you that? Like, if God is so loving, then why did God allow this? Why? These were good people. And, I, and listen, I've, I've tried to break down the theological process and everything, and let me tell you something, it goes over their heads. So you know what? I have simplified the answer, and 99.99999% it always works. I tell them this. I said, here's the deal. You ask the great question, why do bad things happen to good people? I said, I'll tell you why. Because bad things happen to good people, but bad things also happen to bad people. In other words, evil doesn't have a preference. Evil is evil. Evil will take out a good person, and evil will take out a bad person. So there is no preference. I sit, and then that's when I come into the theological, you know, understanding. We live in a broken world. Sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God. Satan says, oh, opportunity. That's like you as a parent, right? Let's say you got little ones, right? I'm taking care of them at the supermarket. But let's say I decide I'm just going to leave them here and I'm going to go back home, drive back home. What did you just do? You just left an open door for anything to happen to those kids. You separated yourself from being now their protector. Now they have to fend for themselves. Well, when you bring God into the picture, you'll always have a father who protects you. Amen? Are you understanding this? And let me tell you, it works 99.9 percent of the time it really does but we have to understand that history is a record of crisis do you realize that you have a history of crisis i think we all forget this because people do ask that like like they think like crisis like happened like every maybe decade or so no crisis are happening right now some of you may be in a crisis for example maybe you're in a crisis of paying your mortgage right now you can't pay your mortgage maybe you're in a marriage crisis maybe you're in a family crisis maybe you're in a health crisis you're in a cancer crisis a disease crisis what crisis are you in but we're all experiencing something you look at history nelson mandela he was in a crisis you look at dr martin luther king he was in a crisis right you look at abraham Abraham was in a crisis. He told, he told God, I have no child. I have no descendant. That was his crisis. You look at Daniel in the lion's den. He had a crisis. He refused to bow down to idols, and so he was in a crisis. What made Jesus famous, guys? The cross. That wasn't a church question. What, what made him famous? The cross. It was a crisis. But let me tell you something. There was no cross and there was no grave that can hold him down. Nothing. All of us experience crisis. A crisis is anything that happens to you that you, could, that you couldn't control or you couldn't stop. I think once you realize that, listen, I have no control of this crisis. It's something you could not control and it's definitely something you could not stop. That's what happened at Saga's High School. We couldn't control it. And we can stop it. Evil does not present itself and warn you when it wants to do what it does. It just happens. And the impact of that crisis is always this fear, trauma, anxiety, separation, isolation. These are the, these are the symptoms. That's when you know that you're dealing with something. That's why I brought Dr. Jason with us today to speak to us, to kind of give us some wisdom here. Now, the only thing we will be known for in a crisis okay in this life are the things that we overcame you look at all these people that were in the crisis whether it was in the bible the disciples whether it's the prophets whether it's those who serve god or whether the people that have literally changed the world here in our time they all overcame that's the beauty and i believe that santa Cur Cur clarita is resilient i believe that santa clarita is going to bounce back i believe that that when we say Saga is strong, oh no, our students are coming back. They're going to come back stronger, wiser. Man, they're going to come back more unified. That's what I'm praying for. That's what you should be praying for. That our students in this valley will be more unified than ever before. I mean, we already saw it at the football game in Valencia High School. It was no longer about team or school names. Everybody was one color, blue. Are you hearing me? So resilience is that indescribable quality that allows some people to be knocked down by life and come back stronger than ever. The question is, are you resilient? 
Or are you still on the ground? You've got to get up. We have to get up at some time. But we do this how? Together. Let me tell you another thing about what's happening right now. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of anger. Talked to another parent this morning. Okay? Parent from Saugus. Okay? Their child is angry. Child had their own expressions of what they're feeling right now. Even about the shooter. And, and those are normal feelings. It's okay. But let me tell you something. Forgiveness says to the offender, I'm beyond your reach. When, 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 when unforgiveness keeps encamping and, and, and living in your heart, let me tell you, not only are you getting bitter, but that offense has already created handles in your life, and they control how you're moved, right? They got, they got control of your EB, your emotional buttons, and you just can't let that. But forgiveness says to the offender, man, I'm beyond your reach. Yeah, I was offended. I was hurt. And, 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 and I'm angry right now. But at some point, you're going to be like, but you're beyond, you're beyond reach. No, no, no. Forgiveness. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So forgive whatever's holding you back. If you have to hold a ceremony of forgiveness, come on, put that bad boy to death. Amen. Put that thing in the ground and say, you are dead. No more. You're, you're, you no longer have a reach in my heart. You no longer have a reach in my life. Things are going to change. Are you hearing me today? All right. So now, without further ado, I'm going to come back and close this, but I want you to help me welcome Dr. Jason Plunkett, and he's going to bring a great word. Come on, Dr. Jason. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, if you could stand, can you please stand real quick? So first we're going to be in a mind, mindful place. So we're going to take a deep breath, because we're going to talk about some heavy stuff. So we're going to take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. Okay, the second thing we're going to do is cross our arms. Can everyone cross your arms? Okay, so now recross it the other way. And how long did that take you? Did it feel kind of weird? Right, but you did it. It was probably uncomfortable. The weirdest thing is uncrossing your arms and doing it, because we, we've done this the same way almost all our life. So once we do it this way, it feels weird, right? But you did it, so that's what we're going to do today. Even though it's uncomfortable, we're going to talk about some stuff, and we're going to do it together, okay? You can please have a seat. As we talk about trauma, I want you to understand that trauma triggers trauma. So whether it, this hits home really close to you or not, any traumatic experience that we've ever been, been in, can, this can resurface it. So I want to give everyone the opportunity to be able to put yourself in a place where it's safe for you. So again, I'm going to ask you to do something. If everyone could just close your eyes. Put yourself in the, in the, the safest, funnest, smell goodness uh, place. Uh, think about how it smells. Think about how it looks. Think about what you're doing. For me, it's Malibu Beach sitting on, sitting on the white, warm sand. Okay, thank you. Don't get too stuck there. We're going to, we're going to come back. And why I'm going to ask you is because, so everyone can open your eyes now. And why I ask you is because there's going to be some times where trauma may come up for you. It might be triggering. You might think of some, some times in your life that wasn't, where you felt like you didn't have control because that's what trauma is. That's what crisis is. It's not having control over a certain situation. Uh, you could go back to that place in your head. And I want you to hold on to that because that's, that's something that you could use in any aspect of your life. Not just right now discussing it, but anytime you feel that place, go back to that safe place. You can even go back to that safe person. For some of you, you might have been in someone's arms. You might have been next to someone. You might have had a friend next to you, right? So we're going to start off uh, with the first slide. My job is to give you tools through this process in how to cope. The word of the, of the day is cope. How are we going to cope through this process? We're going to cope through self-care. It's important to understand what self-care is because if we don't know how to handle our own self, then we don't know how to handle our situation in, in, with, when we uh, are with other people. So self-care deals with self-management and a self-understanding. Understanding what's coming up for you in the moment and also knowing how you process, how you process feelings, how you process thoughts because the, self, then the self-care then turns into self-management. So let's talk about through some of these things. The awareness, that's what we just shared. What does kindness look like for you right now? It's not a time, just like Pastor Mauricio said, it's not a time for, really, for us arguing over simple things. I had two friends off, uh, arguing off of uh, something that was uh, offensive. People lost their lives. We have a new normal in this town. We're known as Awesome Town. 
We never thought it was really going to come our way. What I shared before is the fact that I, I've sent memes before of, let's pray for Texas, let's pray for Paris, let's play for Florida. I didn't think I was going to get one to say, let's play for Santa Cruz, let's play for Saugus. I literally, when, when I heard that, when they sent that to me, there was a depth in my heart that just, it just sank uh, just a little bit more because I didn't think it was going to happen here. So having that awareness of what's coming up for you in the moment and actual feelings. So a feeling isn't I, right, cool, it's, it's, I'm, 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 I'm good, good is okay, but I'm, I'm actually feeling happy, sad, glad, alone, lonely, confused. It's going to be important for us to identify those feelings because if we don't identify those feelings, we will act out those feelings. And feelings are meant to be felt, hence the word feelings, right? Oftentimes we don't want to feel feelings, but we don't, and, we don't mind, and we don't want to feel feelings, we don't want to share feelings. Even when someone feels sad, ew, I don't really want to hear your sadness too much because I might feel sad. Although that's what empathy is. And this, we have to stand in a place of compassion and empathy right now, but sometimes it's hard because, oh, uh, you're making that come back up for me, so I don't want to hear it. What we are open to doing, what we are open to doing, hello, 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 test, okay. So what we are open to doing is sharing our thoughts. So, we're, so we'll go on social media and share our thoughts and our opinion, but we're not as open to share with our feelings, but it's important for us to identify what those feeling, real feelings are. So also, let's, let's talk about paying attention. Pay attention to your body. Pay attention to what's around you. Being mindful of what's going on. Uh, I'm very mindful of what's going on right now. You can go in Starbucks and you can see someone who looks sad because of what's going on right now. So it's not a time to argue. It's really not a time to uh, talk, much like Pastor Mauricio said, about political issues or think about things that are, out, are outside of what's going on in the moment. So paying attention and being mindful in the moment. Uh, priorities, what's your priority? We're going to go deeper into that, so I'm going to, I'm going to hold right there. Community. Common unity, and we're going to talk more about what common unity means and what that really looks like and how we can help each other, how we can come together in this time. I love the fact that I've seen families come together. I had the honor of talking to two of the young students who witnessed this, and it was two different families that were loving on each other, holding hands, and we were praying, and we did a bunch of things together, and it was amazing just to see that come together. I don't know if they knew each other from before this, but that's what we need to do in our community. And, uh, and acceptance, accepting each other for who we are, for what happened. I love the fact, the fact that Pastor Mauricio prayed for the mother. That's one of the first things I did. That's what empathy looks like. It's not about blaming. If you're blaming, then it's just the opposite of empathy. If you're angry, it's okay to be angry and sin not, right? But then anger stops you from being, having empathy towards something. So what you show empathy is, I, how must that feel? Or I knew I, I've hurt before. I might, not know, I might not fully understand what you're going through, but I know I've hurt before. I know I've, I've felt sad before. So being able to put yourself in that. Please go to the next slide. So if you know me, I actually don't like to focus on self. Although I did talk about self-care, and self is really important, because I think we're in an environment where we, we rather do a selfie than ask someone to take a picture for us. I asked someone just the other day, can I take a picture for you? They're like, no, we're fine. And they rather selfie it. I'm like, okay, I didn't, I didn't quite understand that, but... Uh, we're also really self-centered sometimes. Sometimes we're selfish. So the word self sometimes gets in the way because we're not focusing on others. But I want to give you a different understanding of self. So we're going to break down what self is in regards to this. Let's make sure we're secure. We're secure physically, emotionally, and spiritually right now. That we're secure, that we are a secure place in within us, and that we're a secure friend. We're a secure church. Secure, uh, we're a secure school. They're allowing that for people that comes around us to know that, we're, that, we're, that we are safe. Emotions. Emotions are just that. Some people think emotions are feelings. So feelings are what you're meant to be felt. Emotions is how you emote those feelings. So once you feel a feeling, then your emotions is, how, is what you do with those feelings. right? So we have to be understanding of what's, what we're feeling, what we talked about earlier, but how are we sharing that? How are we sharing our sadness? And it's okay. Let me normalize that for you. It is okay to be sad. It's okay to be sad in this type of situation. It's okay to feel that loss of control. If you're feeling that, it's okay. You don't have to act like you don't. You don't have to stuff it. You also don't have to act like everything is perfect. When we stuff, things are still going to come back out of us. I've had, I have 50, 60-year-old clients right now who lived a great life or thought they did, and they are coming back to me because they stuffed something that happened to them when they were a child. So I want you to understand that the most important thing right now is communication and comprehension. Lots of people say communication is the key. Jason Plunkett doesn't think so. I think communication is good, 
but I think comprehension is the key. What I like to say is if I tell Pastor Marisha how amazing he is and I love him, he's my brother in Chinese, that's going to go over his head. Don't you, you know Chinese? You don't know Chinese. So that's going to go over his head, right? But comprehension is key. He has to understand what I'm telling him for him to fully understand it. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, and future. What future do we have? Well, we have a strong future in Christ. We know what the future is going to look like, so be able to hold on to that future. We're going to talk more about that because we're going to describe our why and how to pursue forward. But I want you to hold on to self as security, emotions, loss and grief, and future. And with regards to loss, it's, loss of all, it's not just loss of those who passed away. That is grief. But it's loss of control. It's loss of the fact that I had to talk to my nine-year-old little girl on what to do in a type of situation like this. I actually did talk to my junior high kid. I did talk to my high school kid about this years ago. But I didn't think I was going to have to ask a nine-year-old, where would you hide in a type of situation like this? I felt like there was something lost there. But now we're prepared. Because right now it's about being prepared and prevention. Okay? Um, so, and future. And at the very end of that, so that's self, and that's where care comes in. Okay? We're going to go to the next slide. So as much as we talk about self-care, uh, my favorite word is community care, common unity care. And why is that? Because sometimes it's, I should have to keep the onus on you. I shouldn't have to keep the onus on Pastor Mauricio that he has to take care of himself. He could be broken right now. As a true friend, I should check in. As a true friend, I say, how could I help you? Can I take you to lunch? Let's go to dinner. What's going on? What's going on in your life? Being that accountability partner, being that support, Oftentimes, I say this as Zoe, it's not just about taking care of ourselves, but we want to make sure everyone around us who walks through those doors are taken care of. Our team, if someone needs coffee, if someone needs water, how do we serve you? So the heart is to serve, because what does Christ do? He's, he's a perfect example of servant leadership. Okay, so it's common care unity. As much as you hear about self-care, I want you, as soon as you start thinking about self-care, also think about community care. We can go to the next so these are questions you could take a picture. This is a great time to take out your phones and take a picture of something like this because these are questions I would love for you to continue to question yourself with. I'm sorry if I'm blocking anyone over here. Um, questions to check in with yourself. How am I feeling? So we talked about that already. Very important. I've said that about three or four times to identify your feelings. What are coming up? What's coming up for you? What's not working? That shows you exactly what's not working for me right now. This, all this trauma, this, I'm not, this is not... This is not, I'm not doing good. This is not working. And then the other part to that is, what is working? I tell everyone, it's really important to journal. In these opportunities right now with all the various traumas and crises is coming on, journal. A journal helps out. It's like the map of your life. Why? Because let's just say I had an amazing day because I, I got up, I prayed, I went for a walk, I worked out, and I, had, and I had lunch with Pastor Mauricio. Then the next day, I slept in, and I was grumpy, didn't talk to one, anyone, isolated, and I just had a bad day. That should be journaled. And why I know that is because the next day when I'm not showing, sure how I feel, I could go back to, oh, the good day, I did work out, I did pray, I did have lunch with a friend, and then you're able to identify all those various things. So while we're going through this crisis, it's really important to journal. The first thing I hear about journals that we, more, more, that we don't want to share something or we don't want to overshare or someone could look at our journal. I think there's lots of apps for that right now. So I just want to encourage you. There's apps where you could hide your journal or, or anything like that. What do, uh, what's happening? It's really important. What, what's happening right now? Just being mindful of what's happening and not stuffing it or uh, ignoring it. Oftentimes when we have trauma or we have crisis, we really push it to the side and then start thinking about other stuff. That's, that doesn't mean that you can't think about other things. Go to the movies. Have some fun. You don't have to focus on um, a specific trauma or drama or tragedy or crisis, but you don't want to act like it doesn't exist. Because if you act like it doesn't exist, it will uproot itself at some aspect of your life, at some point. And if parents, I want you to be the role model to this. Oftentimes, we don't want to share our feelings or ask how someone is feeling because of the feelings that came up that, that's coming up for us. So if we can be able to be that role model, we'll be able to do the same. What am I proud of? I think is a really important thing to be able to ask yourself, because oftentimes I don't think we do. I mean, we take pictures of different things, and we, we take selfies, and we let people know the things that we're doing, but are we actually using that word? What am I proud of? 
I'm going to tell you something I was proud of, right? And it goes back into like kindness, uh, something that we're going to talk about later on. And so I bought this gentleman that hopped out of a Maserati. I really like cars, so I was already watching him because I was looking at his Maserati, right? So then he, uh, I was in Starbucks. He's right behind me. So I told the person, here's $10. Can you please pay for his drink, right? So then the guy, his thing gets paid for. He doesn't understand why his drink got paid for or whatever. So, he, so then they pointed at me. I told him not to tell him it was me. But then they, he pointed at me. And so the guy came. He's like, he bought my drink. Why would you do that? I said, I just wanted to be kind. I think you deserve it. So I, I, I hope that like put a smile on your face. He says, it did, but no one ever does that for me. That's because he hops out of a Maserati. Yeah. <laughs> right? So if he sees someone that hops out of a Maserati, he doesn't need that. Right? He, don't need, you don't, he doesn't need that. Yeah. He should have bought one for me. Right? But the, the very truth is everyone needs kindness. Everyone needs to be loved. Everyone needs to be showed care. So in this time, that's what I want to, I want to suggest. Let's love on one another. Let's love on each other really hard, really in, intentionally. Let's love on each other. Um, you, do, you guys do a great job at Elevate. I was shared in the other service that I didn't even know I need tea, and someone gave, offered me tea, offered me what to put in it, because I didn't even know what I needed. How many times are we in situations that we don't know what we even need, but someone comes along and they offer it? If I didn't have tea, I'd probably be hoarse right now, but someone knew I needed that, and they offered it to me. So that, that's, that's the act of kindness. And then... What can I let go of? And sometimes it's past experiences. Sometimes it's an offense. It's often an offense. An offense, if you look it up in the Greek, is a stumble, means a stumbling block. But we could use those stumbling blocks to be stepping stones. Okay? Don't allow these stumbling blocks to get in your way. I literally was mediating a conversation between two friends who were having an offense. And I had to have them really understand, like, there's too much stuff going on in the world right now. For you guys to be two Christian friends who love each other to be mad that someone said that that person didn't do something. It's, it's, that's, that's, that's too petty right now. That is really too petty right now. Uh, if I could please have the next slide. This is a quote that really touches me because I think, it's, I think it's, it's really true. And for those who would like to take a picture, please. If you never heal from what hurts you, you will bleed on people who did not cut you. And it's very true because while we have our wounds... We often will drip on other people who did not do that because you hurt me because my, my family did this or my friend did this or my ex-husband did this, my wife did this, and we will leak on other people just because we didn't actually get healed and made whole. So the goal is to be made whole, not just triage, because what happens is we put a Band-Aid over our gun wound, and then what happens is we take that off and then we leak on somebody else, and someone offends us and then we leak on somebody else. The goal is whatever hurt us in the past to be able to talk about it, and that's what we want to do right now. So anything that's coming up for you, process it. And yes, it could be a professional or ministry, but be friends. Let's just talk about it. Don't hide it. The goal is to communicate. So in this process, is not to hide from the situation, but to talk about the situation. If I could please have the next. So if you could say this is a good checklist anytime you feel overwhelmed. Let me see how much time I have. Okay. So for one, relax your shoulders. You don't understand how simple that is sometimes if you could just... I think some of y'all even said ha when you did it, just because it feels like that. It feels like a ha. Three breaths. Sometimes some people say ten. Sometimes some people say three. Inhale through your mouth. Exhale out, uh, out your, uh, inhale through your nose. Exhale out your mouth. Gives oxygen to the brain. That's why you yawn. So when you're yawning, people say you're tired. Well, you're tired because your brain needs oxygen, so your brain tells yourself to yawn. For those who didn't know that, so that's why taking deep breaths actually help, and it could actually help calm you down. Reconnect to your why. I tell everyone, remember your why, because that will help, help you start something or stop something. My why is to do this, 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 and that, so therefore I'm going to continue to move forward. That's now my external motivator and my internal motivator. It could be both. But, or I could say, you know what, why, why am I even a part of this right now? This is not a part of my why. Why am I doing this? And I could pull you out of situations that you don't need to be in as well. Uh, list your top three priorities. That could be an external motivator in of itself. I'm doing this because these are the priorities in my life. I want to, I want to be a, re a reflection of Christ. I want to impress my wife. I want to be a role model to my kids. Three priorities. So should I stop doing it or should I, should I continue to do it? And that will let you know exactly how you're feeling. And that goes for processing feelings as well. For some of us, we got to get out of bed just for our kids. Because, we, because they're a priority to us. Some of us, we have to mend conversations. I mended my, my, I mended my relationship with my dad because I wanted my son to have a grandfather. And I didn't grow up with him. So I said, okay, well, let me mend this. 
what's my priority in this? My son was my priority, priority, then we mended it. And then we became great, uh, had a great relationship. Take a, take a break. Sometimes you just need to pause. Uh, we're, we're always moving so fast. Go for a walk. That's my thing. That's why I put it on there. If, uh, my staff will tell you sometimes they can't find me because uh, I just need to go for a walk. I just need to clear my head and go pray. I take prayer walks down Main Street all the time. Uh, end up praying for people and <laughs> leading people to Christ sometimes, but it also just gives me the opportunity to recalibrate. So you get to recalibrate, so I get a re-download from the Lord. That's how I look at it. Now he downloaded some new things to me, and then I can go back into work. Uh, adjust your schedule. Sometimes you need to take that Friday off. Sometimes you need to take that Monday off. Um, because you just need time for yourself you, or, or time for your spouse or time for your child. Uh, I'll take my kids out of school sometimes and just have a, have a play date just because uh, I'm missing that time between us right now, so I'll readjust my schedule. And ask for help. Huge, 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 huge. I have to go to the center of the stage huge because ask for help because we don't. Right now I want you to uh, think of the five people in your life that you can call on any moment, but I'm only going to give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And maybe half the room probably didn't even get to five. But you might have that five. Why do I say five seconds? I say five seconds because if I, if I don't, then you're going to make a list of people who are your Facebook friends and your cousin that you grew up with back in the day that you might call. But you ain't going to call them. The five people that you just mentioned are the five that you know you can count on at any given moment in almost any situation. So support is huge. And uh, that's from pastors to therapists to I don't, who, you could be supporting others. You make sure you receive that support as well. Okay. Uh, and if I could please go to the next slide. Five things to ground yourself. These are our five senses. Very important. Even though you might not be that type of person to be like, oh, this sounds kind of hippie-ish. I don't know about this. Trust me, because that was me. I, 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 I was like, that's kind of hippie-ish. I don't know. I've done it. Five things you can see. Five things you can feel. Three things you can hear. I shared with the last uh, at church uh, just a minute ago that fact that I was doing work. I was praying and doing godly work, and I was annoyed that the birds were, were all loud outside. And immediately I got convicted, and the Lord shared with me that the birds are praising, and I wasn't. So I said, oh, okay, well, I could, I could do that, right? But I wasn't listening. I wasn't being mindful enough to just see what was going on around me. And things you can smell, things you can taste. I'm a foodie, so I, well, good food I like to smell, right? But it could also be things like God's creation. It could be roses. It could be flowers. It could be plants. It could be the ocean spray, right? And I think this is going to be the last slide. If you could please go to the last. This is the end of the week check-in. I'm asking you that, you, that everyone do this. This doesn't, what this does, it allows you to look at your, the totality of your whole week. So I feel, and then share it. I feel happy. I feel, I feel accomplished. Or, no, I don't feel that accomplished. I need to do more next week. I need huge, especially grown-ups, especially parents. I need. Oftentimes, we meet the needs of everyone else other than our own. I forgive. Humongous. That could, be, that could be that one thing that's pulling you down and dragging you down right now. I celebrate. Celebrate yourself. Celebrate your teams. Celebrate your kids. Celebrate each other. I think it's huge when we can compliment each other and affirm one another. Uh, I release, almost like I forgive, but it's things that just don't, I'm, not, I'm just not, I'm shrugging that off. I'm not allowing, allowing that to bother me anymore. Oh, that person's talking about my, it doesn't really matter anymore. I'm going to release that. And then I trust. And of course, trust in God. But then trust, in, trust the process, trust your support system, trust the people that love you. Thank you. Stay here with me, Dr. Jason. I got a few texts, and, uh, and you know what? We don't often do something like this, but it's so necessary. Are you guys enjoying this? Yeah. yeah okay, let me give you some, uh, some answers to some questions. We've had some pretty tough ones today. Um, one of the biggest ones that we got today, and that was at 8 a.m., uh, we had one of our students here that witnessed, um, well, the girl that was killed was her, was her best friend. And uh, she witnessed this, and she was basically saying, how do I get, how do I get that out of my mind? How do I stop it? Yeah. And, uh, and I'm sure that you didn't have to be there as a student to experience this. Yeah. You know, so often we think only of the victims, 
But I'm also thinking about the victims outside of the school, you know, that, uh, that have been hearing. Because I know that you talk, right? So everyone's sharing information, and it can become traumatizing. So, you know, the, the good question is, like, how do you just stop the sounds of the gunshots and everything? How do you stop that? Well, the one thing that we did earlier was that we imagined ourselves in a more healthy place and our in our safe place. So anytime something negative like that pops up, we can switch that thought. We have full control of our thoughts, so we can rebuke thoughts, we can cancel thoughts, and we can switch thoughts. So we can put that play, we can put that in place of that. Now it takes a lot of communication and sharing. The word says, "Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks." Right, and then so the, all those abundance of the hearts and everything that's in here, those are our thoughts as well. Because thoughts are just silent, silent words. Yeah. So what we have to do is replace that and ask the Lord to continue to renew my mind, renew the images in my, in my mind. But sharing it is actually one of the number one ways to get out of it. So, of course, you pray, but then you want to replace, and then, you, and then you want to be able to process. How many parents do I have here today? Lift your hand if you're a parent. Okay, listen right. to this one. Listen. Yeah. Here's a question. Okay, this was, this was from a youth. How am I as a youth supposed to express my feelings and emotions to my parents who aren't willing to understand how I feel, who believe that how I feel is wrong to them. Yeah. That's it. Listen, that's the, I want you to, I want us to hit that for a little bit because the reason that most youth and children are end up being suicidal, whether it's even just having the thought of suicide, anxiety, depression, most of it, I can always link it back to parents that don't give their children permission to feel. And listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that as a parent growing up, I was like that. Some, you know why? Because as Christians, we're faith people. Yeah. And we have this mindset that because you're faith people, you're not feel people. No, we're humans. We feel. F feelings, it, feelings are not a negative thing. They're a positive thing. It helps you identify where you're at. It's like the GPS of where you're at psychologically, emotionally. It tells you where you're at. So how do you respond to that? Because that's a great question for you to, to, to send. That. Don't be looking at your child right now. I'm like, could you send that right now? <laughs> if you uh, so do that, then you just say it was you. I'll speak to the, the child first, and then I'll speak to the parents. Yeah. Uh, to that child, just keep on trying. And identify that one caring adult in your life that you can't open up to. And I, I believe that your parent will continue to have that open voice, especially if you pray for them, that the Holy Spirit will guide them to be that caring adult. But if you find that one caring adult, find that one caring adult that you can share almost anything with. The hope is that it would be a parent. Um, and just continue to try. For the parents, Christian parents specifically, stop it. Oftentimes our parents come to, our kids come to us and say, so my friend was smoking weed and I think she's having sex. We're like, what? What? Don't talk to them. Go, don't, don't do this. Go over there. Don't go to that party again. And they were already dismissed the child. We need to be a little bit more open. We need to be able to hear them out. We need to give them tools on how to deal and handle these type of situations. I'm not going to lie. When my daughter does that, everything in me wants to tell her that. So when she leaves, I kind of scream and go into a, talk to a pillow, go into my office and, and whatever. But I tell her, okay, sweetheart, so, you know, so what do you plan on doing? Or asking her different questions, coming from a place of inquiry instead of advocating all the time. Oftentimes we're advocating don't do this, don't do that, instead of pulling information out of them coming from a place of inquiry. So parents, continue to ask questions. Support them. Support them when you have those hard, those hard conversations. Be prepared for those hard conversations. And if you're not prepared for those hard conversations, you may look, need to look in the mirror and do that check-in that I just did. Because it might be, oh, what, am, what are the feelings that are coming up for me? Am I a bad parent? I don't want to hear this. Okay, so parents, be a little bit more open to hearing for that, for that, for that youth that share that. Please keep on trying. And please identify that yeah, one thing. And, and I didn't say it was from this service because okay, okay, okay. I don't want to get any youth okay, in trouble. Okay, yeah. Look you straight. Know, look straight. If it was I have you. a lot of questions. <laughs> don't We've blink. Had a lot look straight. Of questions. Yeah, look straight. Don't look anywhere, please. Right here. Uh, here's another one. How do you uh, not let fear grip your children from going back to school? Yeah, that's probably the hardest thing. But so so trauma and processing trauma uh, could, could take a while. So the very truth is that fear is there. That's real. I know we conquer fear with a sound mind and love, but that doesn't mean that fear is still not there. Yeah. Oftentimes we try and rush it because we're Christians. We're like, oh, no, the Lord's going to be with you. You go. Nah, I don't want to go. I'm scared. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. 
I had the pleasure of talking to two gentlemen, and they're athletes, and they witnessed, they witnessed the, uh, the shooting. And we told them this is a new normal for them. They now are going to go to stadiums and arenas and fields and hear people loud noises and sounds and, and pops and all this other stuff that is going to change your life literally forever. But we don't want to say that because we're like, no, it's going to be okay. No, we, we, we need to understand that it has changed. But you're going to be able to cope, and you are going to be okay. And we do serve a God that's going to be your comfort and your joy and your peace. And I'm here for you, right? So we're, but we have to understand that's a new normal. It is okay to be fearful right now. That's just that's a feeling that comes up for you. Share that, but process through the fear. Don't allow the fear to allow you to just be stuck in your type, in your situation. But trauma does take time sometimes. Yeah, and and right now we've had parents cry to me and say, "How how can I even let my child go back to school?" Yesterday when we were sitting with the families, they're like, "I I can't let my child go back," and of course, that's the way the parent feels, right? And so you also have to start learning how to manage. Like take what you learned today. If you need to get professional help, then you get that professional help to deal with your trauma because uh, the, the worst trauma is vicarious trauma. Yeah. You want to talk about that real quick? Yeah, and that's just you feeling that person's pain. And that's so sometimes people get that confused with empathy. But I'm talking about that trauma where it's, it's bothering you. You can't yeah. sleep now. You, you, you didn't put the mask over your own face. You're putting the mask on someone else's face, and now you're, you can't breathe. So, no, vicarious trauma can happen that way. But the goal is to meet whoever is in the traumatic experience, meet their need. Be a great listener. What do you need in the moment and serve that? Don't act as though you're feeling their feelings. Yeah. If they say they're okay, move along with that. It's okay. Try, try it. And if they're not okay, then you'll figure it out. But uh, I would say specifically parents, listen to your children right now. It's going to be really important. Yeah, I'll do this last question, then I'm going to finish okay. this. How do you identify uh, a trigger and how do you process through one? Okay. So trigger, another word I use for trigger is a trauma reminder. Most people aren't using that right now, but understand it's a trauma reminder. Any trigger that's just happening in your life right now, in any way, it's a trauma reminder. It's reminding you of some type of crisis or trauma. Even if someone called you a weird name back when you were a little kid and someone brought it up and you're like, what? And that's a trigger for you? It's about paying attention. So how you deal with the triggers is, for one, understand that it is a trigger. It is a trauma reminder. And then you have to identify, okay, what are the steps that I need to take to figure that out. Depending on the trigger, it's going to be different steps. Yeah. But the one thing I would say is prepare yourself to, to react uh, in the most healthiest ways. And sometimes it's not a reaction, it's a response. Yeah. So actually, let me change my wording. It's not a react, it's a response. How do I respond to this trigger instead of reacting to this trigger? So let's just say he stepped on my shoes and I really love shoes. I don't get all offensive. I can say, okay, well, yeah, people used to step on my shoes when I was a kid, and that's a trauma reminder. But I know he loves me. He didn't do it on purpose. Take a deep breath. It's okay. Now I don't have to beat him up, right? So, <laughs> but, thank you. <laughs> I love you, brother. Uh, but but that's really what it looks like. As simple and as, as joking as that was, that's really what sometimes tra some trauma reminders really look like. Yeah, very good. Uh, can we thank Dr. Jason? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> let me let me close with this, and then I'm gonna share. Uh, um, a few points that to some people could be offensive, but honestly, I don't care because I need to get the information to you. If I, if I was a parent all over again, now, of course, I have two kids, but they're, my kids are young adults. They're, they're grown-ups. But if I was a parent, I would want my pastor, my church to share this with me, and so I'm going to share it with you, and I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm trying to bring us to a place of, of not being in denial of the reality in the world we live in today. Okay, so just please uh, know my heart where I come from. I'd rather make sure I equip you than you leave here and, and not be well equipped, okay? So let's just start with the simplicity first and then we'll get into what could be uh, sensitive to you, but it's valuable. Let's start with this. Crisis or crises are inevitable, are inevitable but endurable. That means they're sufferable, bearable, passable. That means they're going to happen. So we might as well start thinking like this. i got to count with the fact that I'm going to experience crisis. But remember in John 16, Jesus said this. He said, in the world you will have trouble. It's not a matter if, it's a matter of when I'm going to have trouble. So it's going to happen, guys. I'm not trying to put fear on you, but we're all going to have times of difficulty, disappointment, discouragement in life. There will be times of suffering, sorrow, grief. There will be times of frustration, failure, fatigue. There are going to be things that are going to happen. But here's the good news. 
but together we can withstand. Together. Number two, crises are unpredictable. In other words, uh, you can't plan them. You can't time them. You can't schedule them. Crises are always unexpected. They're like an avalanche. They just come. And it's, it's like what happened in Saugus. It was unexpected. I never expected. When I heard the choppers over, over my house, I thought it was like, oh, great. Here's another fire. Then I, then I get a text from the city, and then there's the TV, and it's like massive shooting, lock your doors. And it's like, what? It's, it's shocking. So it's unpredictable. You can't avoid it, but you can't overcome it. You can't avoid it, but you can't overcome it with God's strength and God's wisdom. Number three, crises are temporary. Listen, your crises that you experienced or experiencing right now, it's temporary. It's not forever. There's an end to that crisis. It always comes to an end. When you think about David, David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Notice it doesn't say, David didn't say, though I live in the shadow of death. You don't live there forever. He says, though I walk through, I'm going to go through the valley, but I'm not going to live there forever. So there is the light at the end of this of this tunnel our troubles are short-lived and there is an eternal glory which outweighs every single pain that we go through okay number four a crisis are purposeful whether it's doubt depression despair discouragement defeat we have to refuse to avoid it and overcome and Ro- uh, romans 8 28 says this and we know that all things work together for good to those who love god to those who are called according to his purpose notice that when the apostle paul wrote this paul did not promise that we would be able to see how things are going to work out but he did promise that as we trust god that they will turn for our good and you have to remember that and i don't have to understand it now here's where it gets very sensitive are you ready here's where it gets sensitive and i tell you this because i know that this is not a question that people ask at all but this is something that i've been talking to parents about is when do i start talking to my child about this traumatic situation like when at what age well here's what studies show children ages three to five years old after a traumatic event trauma starts setting in in other words your three-year-old to five-year-old already can understand what's happening you know why because they're always on these things called phones so they'll get through it they'll hear about it they'll walk by somewhere someone's talking about it and so what happens is it's the after effect of trauma and so let me just kind of prep you okay so you decide with your child how you explain and everything if you need help you can talk to us but let me now tell you what we need to do as parents because have you noticed that the school system prepares our children for a mass shooting right they go through drills and everything but have you noticed that though the child may be prepared parents aren't prepared we're, we're we, we are not prepared we don't know what to do we don't know how to handle this so i want to give you the things that some people may think as insensitive but i think we need this here's point number one okay let me give you the picture run hide fight you got to start teaching your kids how to run because you know what there's that whole uh, uh idea of there are kids that that either take flight and there are kids that fight but we need to teach our kids that they have to run hide and fight and hide means they have to learn how to find shelter it's not just you know what okay let me send my kids to school and let the school take care of my kids no we don't live in that stage that 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 day of age anymore you as a parent we take responsibility for our children and we have to know what is the the protocol in order for our children to survive any mass shooting that takes place now i'm not trying to put fear on us even in our church listen you notice we have armed security here we have cops that attend our church and you know what i always tell them please always conceal in our services and they do why you don't know who they are they're sitting in the services you don't know who's in here but trust me we're prepared for anything that could go down at elevate church that's using wisdom don't you want to come to a place that's safe Okay, well, how about you start creating that atmosphere for your children as well? So you, you hide means you've helped them find shelter. And then the worst case scenario, if you have to fight to save your life, you have to tell your kid, you fight to the end. Think about it. It's like the old, you know, teaching we did with most of us when we were in school. Remember, it was the stop, drop, and roll? 
Okay, well, you got to teach your kids right now at home. You got to be like, okay, this is what you got to do. Number two, you have to teach your kid this, okay? Please, if you see something, say something. Most teenagers, let's be real, they'll say things like this. I don't want to be a rat. I don't want to rat out my friend. Well, let me tell you, tell you, teenager and mom and dad, you tell your kids it's not about writing someone else. It's about saving someone's life. Whether it's the person that's going to cause the harm, right? Or if it's the person who may harm themselves. And if, you know what, here's, here's probably a good question that parents uh, may ask is, how do I know if my child is one of those people? Well, it's this simple. You have to know your child's character. You know, if they start dressing different, hearing music that's a little bit out there crazy, you start seeing their temperament is a little bit off, they're out of character, you know, they're having a lot of isolation, you see them sleeping more, depression, you know, you start seeing these signs, you know what, that's a red flag, something's happening there. You can't say, oh, that's just what teenagers go through. No, don't be ignorant, please. That's ignorance. No, no, no. Every single person, including yourself as a grown adult, we all have emotions and feelings and things that we go through that we also have to identify so that we can get the help that we need. Okay, so if you see something, say something. Number three, make sure you and your child understands the school protocols. Here's what I would encourage you. If I was a parent, okay, I would want you and I definitely would call the school and have them send me what their protocol is. And I would go over it with my child and make sure that I, every so often we're sitting down and we're talking about, okay, let's go. What do you do? I'd quiz them. I'd go over, okay, what do, you, what, would you, what do you do if this happens? What do you do if you hear this happens? What if you, what we have to prepare. Isn't it sad that we today have to now talk about something like this? But it's, it's the new normal. And you can't deny that, that this is the world we live in. It's the reality, but we can also uh, be ready. Okay, um, number four. This is a good one. If all else fails, look for a fire extinguisher. Okay, tell your children, and this is for you too at work, anywhere. You, you grab a fire extinguisher, you tell your kid, man, if there's something that happens and you got to fight, you get a fire extinguisher and you just spray them. You know why? Because that stuff inside the fire extinguisher will blind someone. And you know what? And if that doesn't work, you know what else you can use that fire extinguisher for? A weapon. Hit someone over the head with it. You know what I'm saying? Whatever you have to do, you, you have to train your children. You got to speak the truth. You got to make sure that they're prepared. Okay, so um, you can hit somebody. Number five, run zigzag, hide, fight. Picture. This is what it looks like. Picture. Guys, picture. Okay, it's funny and amazing how uh, when you play football, and I used to play football back in the days my son played football, one of the biggest things that the coaches teach you is they teach you runs, right? They teach you zigzags. And you know why they do that? Because they're preparing you for what? They're preparing you for hits, but they're also preparing you not to get hit. Well, you have to take the time now. I'm telling you, as a pastor, as a shepherd who loves you and your family and your children, you have to make sure that you start talking to your kid. Hey, listen, if there's ever, never run straight, always zigzag. Why? Because you can dodge bullets. That's what we want them to do. We got to talk to them. Is this sensitive or what? Super. Does it need to be heard? Yes, it needs to be heard, and I'm not going to be afraid to speak up. The other one is hide. If you, put that back, please. If you're, listen, if you're on the ground, stay on all fours. You know what, one of the things that Dr. Jason said, he asked his nine-year-old daughter, okay, what would you do? Where would you hide if there was an active shooting? She said, under the sink. That was brilliant. Like, man, okay, in the school, there's, you know, sometimes a sink, a faucet. Okay, that's probably the last place that someone's going to be looking for someone. And then the last one is fight. Use what you can use like a fire extinguisher, etc. And the last one is this. Pray for God's divine protection. You know what, guys? Let me tell you something. A week before school went back in here in Santa Clarita, as a church, I told every single family, I said, you know what? On this Sunday, we're praying for all of our children. We went ahead and we set aside all of our agenda, the preaching and all that, even though we preached, but it wasn't, it wasn't the focal point. The focal point was we said this. This is what we said as a church. I said, you know what? We're going to pray 
that no weapon formed against your children will prosper. We said, we're going to pray that no matter if evil or death comes by, it will not touch your children. Do you guys remember that? And we had a big line of pastors and elders and prayer team members. And we had over 200 children go through this line. And we laid hands on every single child. Wow, because we're not stupid. We believe in the power of prayer, right? Yes, there's the practical stuff. But as a parent, you need to start praying for your kids before they go to school. Why? You got to be intentional. You can't be doing things by accident anymore because when you do things by accident, accident happens. When you're intentional as a parent, amazing things can take place. And let me tell you, we brought all of our kids through this, this, this thing. And it was funny because Dr. Jason told me, he's like, you know what's funny? He's like, you know, one of the youth, when they were coming through the line, because, you know, you always got one youth. You always got one or two. They cray cray, right? And the youth comes like this, and they're like, Whoa. But, and they're just like, because they, they were laying hands on them. So the youth's like, Whoa. like, don't touch me. But then another prayer team member slapped that person in the head like, <laughs> bam. <laughs> oh, no, you get, what am I saying? Listen, parents, you can't do this alone. We got your back. Your child may be like, heck no. Some are like, Psh, no, yes, we're praying for you. You're getting a little bit of oil <laughs> of Aaron's beard. And we're gonna, and, and here's the deal. We love, your, we love your children. We pray for your children. We pray for your youth. As a matter of fact, on Wednesday night, we're bringing in someone to speak. Maybe it could be Dr. Jason. I don't know if you got time. We'll bring Dr. Jason in or someone. But we want to speak now to the youth on Wednesday night, the junior high and high schoolers, and now help them process because whether your child goes to Saugus, let me tell you something. Your student is experiencing some form of feeling regarding all this. And we got to help them. Amen? Bow your head. Close your eyes, please.